I also would suggest to you, and I, this is where I'd like your comments, if Elections Canada concentrated their advertising dollars on a yearly basis on what documentation one needs to provide to be able to vote, now we've got not quite 18 months before the next election if an advertising campaign was started vigorously today, do you think that those people who might want to vote but don't have the proper ID might have enough time to actually go out and get the proper ID? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I if I understand the cr question correctly, and maybe I'll just uh, address your last point, um, if that's okay. Uh, I'm happy to elaborate on, on the previous comments. Um, as I indicated, uh, at least with respect to the Northwest Territories, and I'm, I'm uh, reasonably certain from my experience across the Canadian North that it's true in other communities, um, although a vigorous advertising campaign to um, encourage and indeed illustrate why it's important to have identification documents um, is, is a valuable thing, it won't necessarily motivate individuals to get sufficient identification in advance of polling day. And I know that because we undertook a massive advertising campaign solely focused on the new voter identification provisions that came into force in 2010. A year in advance of the general election, we had posters and guidebooks available in every community. We had uh, radio advertisements in uh, 11 official languages, and radio was still largely listened to in all communities in the Northwest Territories. And nonetheless, uh, legislators, as they've made clear, still received um, complaints, concerns addressed to them uh, as representatives that the voter identification requirements were too strict for people to be able to satisfy and exercise their right to vote. If I can, just before we go to Professor Archer, uh, on the 39 eligible, other eligible pieces of identification, you're saying that was too strict? Or voters would say it's too strict, we can't comply, we can't come up with two pieces of identification out of 39? Uh, I wouldn't say that um, those are as strict as uh, the uh, active uh, photo identification. Um, what I would say is that uh, it's clear that uh, some individuals had a difficulty pulling together sufficient identification required to prove not just their identity but their residence at the polls. That's been put to me by legislators in Northwest Territories and I've taken their concerns seriously. Okay. Professor Archer. Yes, on the question. I'm sorry, Mr. Archer, you always get the end of this. <laughs> yeah, on the question of, uh, of uh, whether election agencies currently provide that information, uh, my sense is that uh, it was a key feature of virtually all the advertising that we did in British Columbia, the, the where and the how and the, and the, uh, uh, the when of voting. Uh, and to that uh, basic information, we've, we also uh, were a bit more active in this last election campaign in focusing the message on parts of the electorate who historically are less likely uh, to vote. And um, I'm happy to say that in the 2013 general election we saw voting increase by about 165 thousand votes in British Columbia and turnout increased by four percentage points. The first time it's been increased over a generation and a half. Thank you. Uh, Madam Lotz Andres, four minutes please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be asking my questions in French, so if you need interpretation, you should use your earpieces. Thank you to both of you for your comments today. They're greatly appreciated. And they will be very useful to us in the pursuit of our work in order to perhaps amend some portions of the bill. I would like to begin by coming back to what Mr. Lukuski was discussing. Would you agree to say that when we hear about the 39 pieces of ID that can be used. Your presentation was very precise in this regard. You explained clearly type 1 and type 2 documents. When we talk about these 39 pieces of ID, there must at least be one that bears the address. And that's where the problem lies, because oftentimes this piece of ID is the one that is missing for people to go and vote. So if I understood Mr. Brock correctly, this is a problem most particularly in remote communities, for example, in your territory or in the north of Canada overall. So I'd invite you to make comments on this, please. Uh, this round. The, um, 
the, the question of, uh, of whether we have the right number of type 2 documents, I think, is a, is a never-ending question. Uh, in British Columbia, we actually don't have a specific uh, uh, identification of all of the identification documents that are acceptable. It's, it, we have categories of documents that are acceptable, and it's at the uh, determination of the chief electoral officer whether a document would be uh, approved or not. Uh, we had some um, uh, commentary this past election uh, on uh, one of the documents that we included for the first time. The, um, uh, historically, what we've done in British Columbia is accept um, uh, a, a hospital bracelet as an identity document. Uh, and um, and even, even uh, mentioning that document, I think, gives people a sense of the breadth of the documents that are that can be used for ID in British Columbia, and then we were working with one of the uh, agencies in the downtown east side of Vancouver, who indicated to us that many of their clients were unable to satisfy uh, the voter ID requirements, even with uh, an expansive list of documents. And so we agreed that we would accept a prescription medication uh, label as one of the identity documents because amongst this group of eligible voters uh, who often don't carry very many identity documents, this is a, is a document that many of them possessed. Now that document in and of itself could not demonstrate uh, their identity, could not satisfy the identity requirements. It would have to be used in conjunction uh, with another document such as an attestation of residence from a homeless shelter, for example. But that example illustrates that, uh, that the uh, uh, agencies uh, work with, with various service organizations to understand how our different groups of electors um, can ensure that they can exercise their democratic right mm -hmm. and not be disenfranchised administratively because they don't carry the same kinds of documents that other voters may carry as a matter of course. So would you agree that um, vouching would be, you know, the, like the final safeguard to make sure that those people, even if they're not able to uh, meet these requirements, will be able to exercise their right to vote? Well, I, I believe vouching is a very important provision within our system. Uh, I, I, I would be uh, uh, surprised if the 14,000 people who were vouched for in British Columbia uh, in the 2013 general election uh, had identity documents on their person that would enable them to vote. I just don't think it was the case. Obviously, we don't ask them that, uh, but I don't think it was the case. And, and consequently, uh, I would expect that many of them would have been disenfranchised for no other purpose than that they uh, didn't have the identity documents that were specified in the Act. They were otherwise, otherwise eligible to, uh, to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Thank you, Madam Let's address Mr. Reed, four minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I have to reset my little watch here. I'm trying to keep track so I don't actually uh, go over. Um, <laughs> no, I just I can't tell. Yeah, I have a yeah. tendency, like all of us, to launch into long-winded questions just yeah. so much of time. I'll just use 15 minutes of your time there, just so you know, <laughs> or 15 seconds. So. That's right. Uh, <laughs> My question, uh, again, you can both respond to it, but I'm sort of hoping it'll, we'll start with Professor Archer this time. Um, you've gone through and looked at different kinds of ID. Um, you uh, have consulted with different organizations about this, and I, I assume some kind of similar consultation process goes on with the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada, uh, and um, before he chooses to add lists, items of ID to his, his list, we uh, on this committee have not had a chance to see uh, what those consultations were, who they are with, uh, what kind of outcomes they produced, what kind of expectations they, they had, um, and then what the results were. Uh, none of this stuff gets shared with us. It's a source of perpetual frustration to me that this and much other information is not shared with us. I, I see our role as being this committee, because he is an officer of parliament, and parliament, he reports to parliament via this committee. We are effectively a board of directors over, and he is management of Elections Canada, which is a, effectively a government corporation charged with the role of administering elections. 
Uh, I sit on another corporate board of directors and uh, we wouldn't put up with the kind of lack of information that flows back from Elections Canada. This has been a systemic problem. I don't blame just Mr. Mayron for this. It's been an ongoing problem. But his initiatives pop out of nowhere without consultation with us. Uh, they are pushed forward without any information being provided to us unless we ask for it. Uh, and uh, then we don't get any feedback on how well they've done, except these sort of offhanded comments that was great success. Totally non-quantified. So my question is, can these things be quantified? Are they such arts that they can only be described qualitatively? Perhaps that's the case. Uh, but could there not be some sort of mechanism by which we would get uh, better feedback as to the merits and demerits of this uh, list of uh, pieces of identification, which in the federal case is 39, but it could be expanded uh, to include others if appropriate. So the reporting relationship between independent officers of the legislature and their assemblies, I think, varies a bit from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I understand uh, your process federally less well than I would understand our process in British Columbia. I know in our case, we, um, uh, we had an interesting dialogue recently with the Legislative Assembly over the requirement for province-wide door-to-door enumeration in advance of fixed date general elections. And uh, the, um, the Election Act was amended to require Elections BC conduct a uh, universal door-to-door -door enumeration. And I brought forward, and we haven't done that since the uh, 1980s in, in BC, because we use a, a continuous register of electors as we do federally. And, um, and so I was preparing to conduct that uh, exercise. I prepared a, a budget for the Legislative Assembly, and it was a substantial budget. It was uh, almost $30 million. And we thought it was going to have almost no positive impact. And so I told the Legislative Assembly that through uh, a Finance and Government Services Committee, which is the committee that I report to. And uh, fortunately, uh, because I recommended that this uh, requirement be eliminated, uh, the Legislative Assembly did eliminate the requirement. We didn't use it in the last uh, election and instead brought forward a, a process of uh, both universal and targeted uh, enumeration, voter registration uplift is what we called it. Uh, we spent about a quarter of the, uh, the funding that the other proposal would have required and we believe we had a very significant impact on the, on the quality of the voters list. And my report on the enumeration activities is being tabled in our Legislative Assembly tomorrow. So uh, when, uh, it, and it strikes me as, as one of the, the natural uh, processes in which we uh, have these conversations with the Legislative Assembly, we advise on, on our activities and, um, and uh, you know, which is not to say that we couldn't improve our process in, in British Columbia, and there may be some tweaks that you'd like to see in, at the federal level as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you. We're going to stop at the end of that round. We have uh, um, run out. Um, Mr. Brock, Mr. Archer, thank you for coming and sharing with us your, your views today and your jurisdictions. It's been great to have you both and a lot of information shared. Um, before I suspend and before the members leave, just a couple of quick pieces of, of, of business also. We had originally set up a time for a South African delegation to come see this committee. They have cancelled. They will not be able to come here. And for those of you still not completely on the paperless test that this committee is doing, please speak to our clerk and, 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 and get there. I'm not carrying any papers around anymore and it's fantastic and I know you will love it too, so please talk to our clerk. Um, anything else for the good of the committee today? Seeing nothing, we will suspend or we will adjourn and uh, I'll see you all Thursday. Some of you I'll see tomorrow. <laughs>